So quick introduction, my name is Zach Waters and I'm the CEO of Black Swan Risk Management for architects and engineers and an insurance broker through IOA. Um, one of the organizers of this program and I will be your MC today. We are super excited to have everybody. Um, as we get started, I wanna just run through a few things here. So this program is set to be 90 minutes. And I've actually talked with our speaker, Patrick, uh, ahead of time. The presentation is not gonna be anywhere near 90 minutes. It should probably not even be half that. We really, really, really want a, a heavy Q&A today because the, the program is, is kind of a guess and a, a sharing of knowledge of Patrick's experience. But the best way for an individual to get value out of the day is to ask a question. And there's gonna be multiple ways to do that. And we have the ability to be able to interact with Patrick ask your question live, uh, ask follow-up questions. So that'll all be on the docket for today. This is part of a series of webinars that we do at Black Swan. So we cover a number of different topics related to the AEC world. Uh, if you'd like to sign up to receive updates on new programs, let me know we can make that happen. Our next webinar is planned for September 21st and is entitled Insurance 101, the basics for architects and engineers. The speaker is George Truly, so I apologize for that in advance, but um, that promises that actually ends up being a pretty good program. So uh, shoot us a uh, an email for more details if you'd like. And now on to our program. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Patrick McLamey, FAIA. Uh, Patrick spent 50 years at HOK, which he grew or helped grow into one of the largest architecture and engineering firms in the world in his time there. He rose from junior designer to CEO and witnessed the growth uh, from a single Midwestern office to 27 locations across the globe, featuring architecture, interiors, engineering, and planning. Uh, Patrick joined HOK St. Louis in 1967. He came out to San Francisco to open the SF office in 1970, joined the executive committee in 95, and served as CEO from 2003 until 2016 in his retirement. Uh, he also currently serves as the international chairman of Build Smart International, an organi organization devoted to improving building standards and sustainability by promoting open. Today's program was inspired by Patrick's recent book, if you can see my screen here, uh, Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm, The People, Stories, and Strategies Behind HOK. And we are actually raffling off a copy of that book today. So I'll send you some more info for that if you want to take part in the raffle. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. And we also have a link if you don't win the book in the raffle to be able to get a discounted version and get Patrick's book. So without further ado, Patrick, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Zach. I'm very, very happy to be here today. And um, uh, I wish I could see my audience. I, I love it when I can, but I'm told that, well, I'm just going to have to to, to uh, imagine how good looking everybody is. I, I do know from Zach that there are architects and engineers in the audience today, which is great. There may be some others who are in the construction area or uh, or some other related field. So welcome all. Um, as Zach said, um, I love questions. Questions, uh, which is a technique that I used inside of HOK to drill down to actually how to be helpful to people, whether it's clients or employees or consultants. Questions are the, the mother's milk of this presentation. So I'm going to have a presentation, but I really love questions. If you have a question as I'm speaking, uh, I believe you can text that. Zach will see it. And Zach, please feel yep. free to break in on me if you absolutely um, if you have a question that's pertinent. Uh, and I'm happy to stop, answer the question, and see where this goes. Perfect. So there's plenty of time. All right. So I think there are 20 slides in this presentation. There are some animations in the 20 slides, so it may feel like it's a little longer. Three common AEC mistakes and how to avoid them. Things they don't teach you in school. When I went to school, before most of you were born, I wanted to design great buildings. And I'm sure the architects in the audience also went to school for reasons like that. Nobody goes to school to learn how to run a great firm. You, you, uh, that's not taught in school. I think I had uh, one class in professional practice in my college days, 
And it was taught by a professor who had never practiced architecture. So I didn't learn much. I had to learn all of this uh, on the uh, inside of HOK from mentors, people were, that were more experienced than I. And, uh, and uh, I wished along the way that I could have learned these things in a more, in a faster way, in a more complete way, but I had to learn as I went. So part of my work here with all of you is to help you learn things that I wish people had taught me early on. We're going to talk about three things today, things to avoid with your firm, designing your firm. You know, um, it's funny. We go to school to learn how to design great buildings, and we, we lavish attention and time on buildings uh, for our clients. But most of us don't spend any time designing the kind of firm we want to have. And you can, and you should. And if you don't, you're probably going to be in the same boat that most firms are in, which is that they struggle. They struggle to uh, make ends meet along the, uh, in, during the course of being around. And usually when the founder retires, the firm dissolves. And so all that, all that knowledge and reputation that's been built over a lifetime tends to go away. How can we avoid that? And then finally, a strategy for excellence you know, this is hard work designing. If you want to stand out, if you want to have a successful firm, you have to you have to be to, to develop a reputation for being really, really good or excellent. And what's the strategy for that? How do you make, make your firm stand out as excellent? So those are the three things I'll be covering. First, things to avoid. These are very simple, but it's very common. First is uh, two people. This comes from an old New Yorker cartoon from many decades ago. What would I do if I inherited a million dollars? Well, I'd probably practice architecture until it was gone. That is the idea of an architect somehow not being interested in or focused on the business side of the practice, only on the wonderful uh, aspects of design. And uh, that's a, a formula for failure. Hope is a strategy. Well, that's not much of a strategy when it comes to opening a firm. And for you engineers out there, I hope that you don't uh, sit on the sidewalk and, and show your engineering calculations to passersby, but you need to have more than hope as a strategy. You need to have a strategy for building a firm the right way. And finally, the thing that I see many, many times is how partnerships are created. And too often, the partnerships are ones of convenience, where two people who are practicing architecture or engineering um, discover each other and decide, you know, if we shared an office and shared some employees, we could cut our costs, and I could do my projects, and you could do yours. And if you brought in a project, I'll help you do it. And if I bring one in, you can help me. That is not a partnership. That's a, that's a marriage or a partnership of convenience. It's not destined for greatness. So those are the things to avoid. Designing your firm is the, is the heart of this presentation. And it comes about from one man, George Helmuth, the founder of HOK. And I want to just tell you briefly about his story. George Helmuth was born in St. Louis, which is where HOK was founded. And his father and his uncle practiced architecture as a partnership called Helmuth and Helmuth, of course, in St. Louis in the early 1900s. And St. Louis at that time was quite a vibrant city. Uh, it was the gateway to the West and was at that time the fourth largest city in the country. And George's father and uncle uh, designed many good buildings in St. Louis, uh, were, were quite successful but not all the time. And as George was growing up, he decided he wanted to be an architect and wanted, to, in the worst way, to join his father and his uncle in their firm and practice with them. Uh, but as he was growing up, what he realized and what he experienced was, see if this sounds familiar today. 
his father and his uncle had a roller coaster ride of a practice, boom and bust. When they had a project, they hired draftsmen in those days, and it was draftsmen. It was men, drafting boards, no computers, of course. And uh, about the time they had those draftsmen trained to become more effective, the project would be over. And then one of the two brothers would scramble to find another project to design. And if they could not, then what did they do? They let all the draftsmen go, and it would be back down to the two brothers. George, George's father and his uncle also both loved to design. So they had some disputes about, well, I get to design this one. Well, no, it was your turn the last time, but yes, but I'm the one that cultivated this client and brought this project into the office. So he saw all that, grew up in it, and then graduated from college in 1930, which is the start of the Great Depression, went to his father and his uncle and said, can I, can I join your firm? They said, we don't have any work. So George Helmuth joined the city of St. Louis as a junior architect, uh, designing comfort stations and bus stops, and did that for six long years. And each year he would go back to his father and his uncle and say, how can I, can I join you now? And they said, we still don't have work. The depression, folks, if you think that the, the, what you've lived through with the, the COVID uh, pandemic is a big deal. COVID was uh, 15 or 18 months long. Great Depression was a decade, 10 years. So finally, George Helmuth left St. Louis, went to Detroit, and uh, went to work for the, the predecessor to the Smith Group of today, Smith Hinchman and Grills. And uh, there he came up with four principles for long-term success. And I'm going to tell you what they are. They're really good for anybody of any firm, any size. And they're as good today as they were when he worked there. The first principle is a, a firm's success is built on talented people. And if you, if you hire people, talented people, do your darndest to keep them. Nurture their talents so they get better and give them a career path in your firm so they can grow up inside the firm and become ever more valuable. And some will become future leaders, successors to yourselves. And that's his core, his cardinal principle, that great firms are built around great people. Second principle is that, well, great people need steady work. And so it was... Helmuth was a pioneer as a marketer. He said, well, if it's that important to get and keep good people, there needs to be someone out there looking for work all the time, full time. So Helmuth's idea was that you, you attract clients by working at it. And uh, you also develop a public relations program. In those days, it was getting published in the architectural magazines. Uh, these days, it's it's uh, being online and, and having people know about you online and so on. And he also had a, a key principle of you market clients, not projects. Clients are the, the entities that give us work. And clients are, if there's anything close to gold in, a, in an architect's life, it's a client. And if you can find a client that has repeat work, like maybe a school district or something like that, those are clients that you can win over the first time. And if you do a great job for them, you'll have steady work for your whole lifetime. So that's the second principle. The third principle is to diversify your practice. What does that mean? Well, first, don't just learn to do one kind of thing. Learn to design, in his case, everything. School buildings and hospitals and churches and office buildings and so on. Because why? Well, because not every building type is, uh, has ready clients at any given time. He, he, he described this as the pistons on an engine. When one building type is slow, another one is up and is faster. So if you're focused on just one kind of building type, consider diversifying into at least one other uh, and two other or three other if you can. Also, Diversify your practice by geography, nationwide or even worldwide. These days with the internet, it's quite possible to have projects and clients anywhere. And uh, why is that important? Well, it could be that 
where you work now, whether it's the Bay Area or somewhere, some other part of the country, things might be slow in in uh, Memphis, but they're really cooking in Tampa. So if you could get a client or an office in Tampa, then you've got work to keep your good people. Again, that cardinal principle to keep those good people in your in your office busy, even if it's not in your hometown. And Helmuth, of course, practiced before the internet, but he was he practiced in the early days of commercial aviation. So Helmuth flew constantly on airplanes to other cities to meet clients uh, and to and to build up the HOK practice and eventually led to this proliferation of HOK offices around the country and then around the world. And then finally, diversify your practice in another way, which is clients don't always need architecture or engineering. Sometimes they need a planning, uh, help with planning, or might, they might need a program for a new building or a new project, or they might need some consulting about how to be more sustainable. Uh, they might need interiors work. And interiors, let me just say, interiors work is some of the steadiest work you can have if you practice interiors in a commercial world because companies are always changing. And even though they might be in the same building, they're constantly changing out how the building, uh, how they're working inside of that building. So diversify, diversify, and diversify. That's principle three. And finally, specialized leaders. Helmuth watched his father and his uncle struggle, both wanting to design, and said, you know, if you, if you really look at how people work, some people are naturally better at design, naturally better at marketing, and naturally better at production than others. And so find yourself partners who, who have complementary skills. And... Uh, then let them focus on those skills. So if somebody's really good at design, if they get to do it all day, every day, over a lifetime, they get really good at it. And your partnerships will be partnerships where you can have harmony because people won't be having power struggles about who gets to design the next building. That's a, that's a key uh, to keeping I think to giving a, a smaller firm an opportunity to grow if, you, if you're in the position of wanting to grow your firm beyond one or two people is to find people that have, don't look for people like you, look for people that, that complement your skill set. Now, in addition to those four principles, which were about how to organize your firm, oh yeah, it's okay, let's review them again, excuse me. Talented people, that's the cardinal principle. Uh, if you don't have talented people, if you have to lay off people, you lose everything that those people have learned when they were in your employee. So talented people, get and keep them. Full-time marketing to support them. Diversify your practice so you never run out of, out of work. And also specialize your leaders. Don't have everybody doing everything. That's a foundation for long-term resiliency. Also, ownership strategy. Most firms uh, remain small in the lifetime of their founder or partners, and most firms go out of business when the founders retire. So Helma set out to design a firm that would carry on beyond the founders, and HOK is now in the fifth or sixth um, uh, succession of leadership. Uh, the founders are are long gone. Two of them have passed away, including George Helmuth. Gio Obata is still living. He's 98 years old, but the other two are, are long since uh, gone. But they would be proud of what we've accomplished. And how do you do that? How do you, how do you have a strategy for uh, ownership succession? Well, one is you limit ownership to active employees. You don't share ownership with your spouse or, a, or your, uh, some friend of yours. You share it with people that are in the practice with you. And if you leave the practice, then you have to leave, you have to give up your ownership share. And younger employees, those, again, those key people, the key to your success, should be able to buy in as they grow in, in ability. 
so that uh, they can eventually, the best of them can eventually succeed you and your and your colleagues. And you should name your successor years early. Don't wait until it's too late. If you if you wait until the year before you you want to retire, you will find that people are not ready to step into your shoes, and your firm will probably not prosper uh, with a hastily arranged uh, leadership succession. And finally, of course, if you're going to do this, people need money. Uh, money is uh, really important and and often misunderstood and overlooked by certainly architects. I hope you engineers are better at this. And uh, well-run firms need to have, uh, need to, to take some of the profits, they need to make steady profits first, and then take some of those profits each year and retain them. Don't bonus them out, uh, invest some back into the firm, yes, always, but keep some as retained profits so that it's a pool of money that you can use to buy out uh, retiring shareholders. And whether it's a partnership share or a, in, the, in the case of HOK, it's a, whether it's a, a, a company share, it doesn't matter. The, the principles are the same. Then finally, uh, something that I added to the HOK uh, metrics, which is how do, you, how do you know during the day, you're hectic, you're busy, how do you know that you're on track and that you're not actually fooling yourselves and you're hovering on the edge of, of, of a bankruptcy or a financial abyss. So here are three simple metrics for a, spend, for a successful practice. Spending, how much can I spend? Here's the biggest mistake most firms make. They have too many people for the amount of fee. So here's a simple rule. It might vary by firm a little bit, but if you're spending more than 50% of your income, your fees, on salaries. I'm not talking about full load. I'm not talking about benefits and so on. I'm just salaries. Why salaries? Well, because most people know what their salaries are. Only the accountants know what the total cost of people is. So if you keep your salaries to about half of your income, then you will find that there's enough money left over at the end of the day to make a profit. And when I say salaries, it's not just for your employees, it's for yourself. It's for non-technical employees, the people that make the coffee or run the errands or everybody, all the people in your practice. That's a 50% rule. The second one has to do with knowing whether you have enough work to, to, to project out into the future. And uh, by experience, I learned at HOK, if an office has 10 months worth, work of, worth of backlog. That is, if I'm earning $1,000 a month in fees, I need $10,000 of backlog in order, order to assure that I have 10 months of work ahead of me so that I have 10 months time to market and get some new, new work in. If you have more than 10 months of backlog, and, and you know it could be 1,000 a month or it could be 100,000 a month, doesn't matter, it's the same, or a million a month. If you're if you're if you're burning through a million a month in in uh, spending, then you need ten million in backlog and so on. Many firms miss this point and run out of work, and they end up using the cash flow from a new project to finish the last one, and that's that's a trip toward the abyss. Uh, if you have more than ten months of backlog, your firm is probably growing, and you're going to need to add staff. If you have less than 10 months of backlog, you may not know it yet, but you're bound, you're headed toward shrinking. And so you're either going to have to find more work or let some of those really, really well-trained people of yours go. And uh, that's that's a that's a failure of leadership. And then finally, cash flow. Cash flow is really important to a firm. It's important to us as individuals. It's nice to have money in your pocket to pay your bills, right? Well, in order to have money, you need to collect it. So the 90-day rule is, if you've earned fees from by working for a client and you haven't collected those fees in 90 days, then to keep yourself on track, you should unearn those on your books. So, the, gee, I just earned $1,000 from Mrs. Jones for her new home edition. 
but she hasn't paid me in 90 days. So I can't count that as earnings and fool myself that I'm actually making a profit because a profit isn't made until you've collected the money. I had a, my controller at HOK had a plaque on his desk. And again, I don't want to turn architects and engineers into accountants, but it's a really good, really good little pithy statement. We work on an accrual system. I work, I earn some money. I counted on my books as earned because I've, I've designed a building or I've, I've produced a set of drawings or something. And, but I haven't collected it yet. So that's called accrual. Everybody here, I'm sure, probably knows about that. Uh, accrual, his little plaque said, accrual is an opinion. My opinion is that I've earned $1,000. The second part of his plaque was cash is a fact. It's only when you collect that $1,000 that it turns from an opinion into a fact. So follow a 90-day rule or a 60-day rule. If you're, if you're really good at this, you'll, you'll find that 60 days is even better. But don't fool yourself into thinking that you've earned money when you haven't collected it. Hey, Patrick, we've got a question from the audience. Oh, um, I love it. How do you balance shareholder greed versus the long-term health of the firm? Interesting question. Yes. Okay. So I assume by shareholder greed, good question by somebody. Um, I assume by shareholder greed, you mean if you retain, uh, if, if you're paying shareholders money to, to buy them out, are they asking for too much? Is that the question? If it is, there's a simple way to do this. And I, I think greed is a misplaced word in, in my case. It's not an opinion, gee, I think my firm's worth a million dollars. The simplest, most basic way to do this is to do an accounting of your, a, a book valuation of your firm. Uh, what's a book value? It's by the accountants. I have certain assets over here. I have certain liabilities over there. What are my assets? My tables and chairs and, and uh, my cash that's in the bank. And so on. What are my liabilities? Well, I owe my consultants this much and I owe some rent and so on. And you and you subtract liabilities from assets and you have a value. So HOK has operated on a book valuation for 60 plus years now. What is a book valuation versus a market value? Well, HOK has regularly been asked by other firms. Oh, gee, would you be interested in being sold? Well, no, we wouldn't. We like the way things are. But they regularly would ask, would would offer us more money than our book value. Why? Well, because there's goodwill involved. If you if you if you have something that's worth more than book value, then um, then it's goodwill, and that means I think because you have such a good reputation for design or for service to a client, or you have such a good client list, you're worth more than the your book value. So I'm willing to pay you more. That's a one-time event. And if you do that, if you're selling a firm as a one-time event, you might get some extra money. But if you're buying out a partner or a principal in a firm, uh, the best and surest way to avoid greed is to do it on based on book value. I hope that helps. I'd love it if there's a follow-on question to that, if I if I got the right idea from the question. Yeah, this- this is from Robert, and I think it's just a follow-up comment. It says, in some organizations, there can be a drive for individual short-term benefits over the long-term yeah. health of the company. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, I just say, maybe you have the wrong partners in that firm. And, uh, you know, greed is, uh, maybe that's a human condition. Um, look for partners. Let me just say, there's a, cult, there, there's a piece about culture later. But let me just comment on it now. If you have the right culture inside your firm, the partners or the principals or the owners of the firm, whatever you call them, should be all lined up and, and, and uh, of one mind that what's important here is not me or you, it's us, it's our firm. And if you have the firm as, as your focus instead of yourself, then you're going to do you're going to do the right prudent things for the benefit of the firm. The other thing you'll learn is that if you're an owner or a, par- a partner or a principal in a firm, 
and you have that attitude, you'll find you're a servant leader. You're actually working your tail off to take care of the people in your firm to make sure they have that they're paid on time, that they have um, steady work, that they're well trained, that they have the latest computer equipment, whatever they need. And in turn, they will reward you as an owner or principal with good projects, good reputation, and profitability, which accrues not just to you, but to everyone in the firm. Here's another way to think about it. If you make a profit at the end of the year, be prudent with it. Don't take it all for yourself as a, well, I'm the owner, so I'm going to get this money. Take, take a piece for reinvesting in the firm. Maybe you need the newest high-end video conference setup or some supercomputer to be able to do great animations or maybe you want to do some 3D models or something. Uh, or maybe you want to go after that really hotshot designer or technical architect in your crosstown rival firm and entice him or her to your firm. These things all take money. Pick, put your firm first. Your, 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 well, put your clients first, excuse me. Put your firm second. Put your, put your people third and put yourself last. And then greed will take care of itself. You'll get, you'll get well benefited. After 50 years, I retired from HOK. I'm very comfortable financially. But so is everybody else at HOK because that's the way we organized ourselves. Good answer. I like okay. it. Um, we did I get love a couple this more line of questions. Yeah, we got a couple more questions along these lines. So um, we got a question from Eddie, which says, for a second or third generation firm, do you have a rule of thumb for internal stock purchase value versus buying out current owners? Yeah, it, an internal reduced rate to encourage purchases. No, absolutely not. <laughs> no, if you operate your firm straight up as a, as a really good organization, you don't want to discount the stock value. And when you do that, if, if the stock is worth $100 and you say, well, look, special, just because you're a good person, we want you to be a, a stock owner, we'll offer it to you for 75 bucks. Well, what you're doing is diluting the stock value. Every stockholder in the company then, their stock is worth a little bit less because somebody didn't pay the full going rate. Uh, instead, if you want to make it easier for people, I think the question, the question behind your question is, how do how do young people afford to buy stock in my company? Well, there's a couple of good ways. When I first bought my first batch of HOK stock, I was a young architect out of school, less than five years. I didn't have savings. I didn't have money of my own to make a purchase. What HOK did. And by then, HOK was a stockholding uh, uh, corporation. And HOK offered me stock and a few other stock, um, which I didn't have money for, but I was really interested in it, is uh, they actually made an arrangement with our local bank in St. Louis, Boatman's Bank in those days, for a, for a loan using the company's credit. So the company was able to give, to, to sell me stock, I took the loan by just signing a piece of paper from the bank to buy the stock. And the company paid the loan off with a little bit of each future paycheck. I think it was a hundred bucks for a future, you know, for, for the next three years or something. It wasn't that much money in the, this is a long time ago, folks. But so that's one way is you can offer to make, to, to get people uh, loans so they can afford, but I would not dilute the stock by giving a discount. Here's another way to do it. At the end of the year, you make profits. If you're not making good, robust profits, why would somebody want to buy the, the stock? If you're making good profits and you have an employee that um, that is deserving of being, let's say, a new owner, a, a minority shareholder, man or woman, doesn't matter. And uh, they may not have the money. Maybe they're at the stage in their life where they just gotten married or they got new kids or braces for the kids to eat, whatever it is, they may not have the money. So what you can do is say, well, look, we're going to bonus out some of our profits this year. And at HOK, uh, we typically, typically year in and year out, 
tried to bonus out about half of our profits, our our pre-tax profit. If you if you if you make a million dollars, see if you can bonus out a half a million. There's some benefit to that, which is uh, the money goes into the employee's hands before it gets taxed, and they have to pay tax on it. But nevertheless, it's their money, and they help you 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 generate that profit. So if you say we have a bonus pool and you're going to get a bonus of ten thousand dollars, but we we'd like to to set aside a thousand dollars for you to buy stock. So we will take that thousand dollars. We'll keep it inside the company. You'll get a nine thousand dollar bonus plus ten shares of stock or whatever it is. Then people become owners without actually having to write a check. So there's give people a loan, bonus some stock out to them as part of a, an annual bonus pool. There's another way, which is more complicated. And uh, if you're a sophisticated company, you can try it, which is to give people stock options. Okay, I'm gonna give you an option. This is, I don't really like this, but I'm gonna give you an option to buy stock in my my, uh, my excellent firm at a uh, current price of $10 a share, but you don't have to buy that stock until next year. So maybe the stock is worth 11 next year and I can buy it for 10, so I am getting a discount. I don't actually like that, but it is something that HOK has done a couple of times, but it does dilute the stock. So there's three ways. Any more awesome. follow-up to that? Um, along the same lines, and this might be a very long, complicated answer, but yep. uh, Daniel had a good question, which was how do you determine book value? Okay, Daniel, uh, if you have, or Daniel and everybody, book value is uh, something that accountants know how to do. Uh, it's you add up all you, you 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 get a piece of paper with two columns on it. You add up the, the value of all your assets on the left side and all your liabilities on the right side, and you total them up. I've got a, uh, I've got a million dollars of assets and a half a million of liabilities. I subtract the half a million from the million I got. I got a half a million of net worth. That's the same thing you would do with your own personal self, uh, your own personal finances as a as a person or as a, as a family. Uh, I own a house, that's, uh, that, that's great, but I, I also have a mortgage. So what's my value? If I sold my house today, out here in California, it'd be a million bucks, but I've got a mortgage on it that's a half a million. So I've got a net worth at, in my house alone of half a million dollars. And you go on through all of those things. I've got some money in the bank, uh, but I also have um, I also have a car loan, so I owe, owe something on my car, and uh, and uh, that's assets minus liability. You don't count cash flow and liability, assets and liabilities, because cash flow varies. Just count things that are stationary. I've got money in the bank. I've got savings. Uh, I've got some some stocks and bonds, and I've got a house and a car. And over here, I've got student loans and this and this and this. And that's the difference between them is any accountant can tell you how to do this. And, and, and it's uh, it's not complicated. It's it's a very basic and simple way. It's it's governed by the the, the rules that, it, that accountants set for themselves. It's a well-worn path. It's, it's a far easier thing to calculate than just saying, well, I think my firm's worth a million bucks. I love this. Yeah. Let me, Zach, let me just suggest, let me get through this last piece yeah, strategy for excellence. And yeah. then let's let's open this thing up. Sounds like a plan. All right. A strategy for excellence. So you know what to avoid or some of the things to avoid. And you know some of the principles for designing a firm that will that will be prosperous. Well, if you're an average firm, so what? What you need to have if you're going to be a, an owner of a firm. You want to be somebody. You want to aspire to something. So, what is that, and how do you get there? So, let's let's talk about a strategy for excellence. You need to have some simple idea that is shared by you and your partners, or your and your firm, about who are we and where are we going. And I like to show it as a pyramid. The first step in the pyramid is you need to have united leadership in your firm. If you have uh, 
a partner that maybe was your best friend from college and you're in business together and best friend from college, you now know and understand that your best friend from college is not necessarily your best partner. Go find a different partner so that you're united in how you want your firm to be and where you're going. United leadership. And notice that the leaders are on the bottom of this. It's going to be a pyramid. They're on the bottom. The best firms are led by not leaders from the top, but leaders from the bottom that are helping to support the whole enterprise. And the next level in the pyramid, I'm calling this great design, but it's actually great design and great operations. It's all of Helmut's principles, how to attract and keep good people, uh, how to support good design or great design, and how to uh, follow those financial metrics so that at the end of the year, you end up with some profit. Um, you know, people that are in the design field, architects, engineers, and people who construct, these are high risk, um, volatile fields. It's difficult work. Um, it's, uh, Zach, I know you're involved with insurance. It's, uh, it's hazardous work. Uh, you know, if you design a building, it's worth easily many times what your firm is worth. If you make a major mistake, we call those firm killers. So that next piece is about getting everything right in, in the way your firm is working, probably with design as the, as the head, as the, the headline but with all those other things working as well. Culture, what's this about? Well, I like to think that if you're running a good firm, whether you're architect, engineer, contractor, or, um, or a specialized firm, you wanna have a firm where everybody in the firm knows and understands what the firm is and what the mission of the firm is, where you're going, what you aspire to do, and one where there's a culture of collaboration inside the firm instead of cult culture of competition. Think about it this way. You got a firm, maybe there's three people, maybe there's 10, maybe there's 30, maybe there's 300, doesn't matter. If the people inside are working like a team, a sports team is a good analogy, a big team where everybody in the firm is helping each other succeed. Let me just repeat that, it's so important, where everybody, is helping each other to succeed because the firm's mission is more important than an individual inside the firm, including the leaders. Everybody is helping each other. So there's collaboration inside. Guess what? You'll be able to compete better on the outside. Let me take that sports analogy just a little further. The men's basketball team in the Olympics, U.S. men, they eked out a gold medal. But these were NBA players, some of the best players in the world. And they eked out a gold medal against other countries that had not nearly the talent. Why did they just eke it out? Well, because their individual stars that were just barely able to play together instead of uh, a team that's melded together. If those players on the U.S. team had been melded into one team, they could have beaten anybody in the uh, in on their best days, anybody in the world easily. As it is, I'm, I'm happy they won, but it's about teamwork inside in order to compete on the outside. There's plenty of competition with your crosstown rivals and the firm in the next town and so on. Uh, if you want to be your best, you've got to have an inside culture that, that supports uh, collaboration. And then finally, where are you going? What do you aspire to be? You want to be a great design firm. You want to be BIM specialists. You want to be the greenest firm in town. You want to do the most elegant structures. Uh, you want to specialize in uh, in sustainability. There's, there's a I, I envy all of you younger people. The, the world is unfolding now. To there's this huge need. There always has been. It's more clear today that architects and engineers and contractors. We've got a big job to do to bring up the building stock in the United States and around the world to keep from, from wasting time and energy and materials on bad buildings. Um, I'm embarrassed to, 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 to say to you all that I've been part of a profession that is, you know, buildings contribute, uh, buildings take up about 40% of the energy consumed, of the energy that's produced in the United States every year every day. 
the focus is on cars and trucks and airplanes and boats, but actually buildings consume more energy than all of those forms of transportation put together. Think about that. Can we get buildings that just sip energy instead of guzzle? And landfills in the United States, it's similar with most of the rest of the developed world with the exception of a few places like Scandinavia. But most of the, 40% of the landfills are, are filled up with um, the remnants of building construction and demolition. That's a horrible, uh, uh, bad legacy. That we, so we have work to do. If you wanna be at the, at the forefront of this, you got to have a really great firm to support this. And, you know, I dream of great firms helping to transform uh, cities around the world where most of us now live into vibrant, wonderful places instead of uh, um, the pretty rough edged places they are today. You need to have an overall strategy. And finally, if you want more information about what I think, there's two ways to consume it besides this um, webinar. You can, of course, get my book, Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm, The People, Stories, and Strategies Behind HOK, with a nice little picture of the founders on the cover. And um, it's part memoir and it's part learning experience with, uh, with lessons learned at the end of each chapter for those who really want to study things. Uh, another easy way to consume a lot of this knowledge is a 14-episode podcast series by Gable Media. Um, called Build Smart um, that is now complete. The episode, the last episode was uh, earlier this summer. So you can just go to gablemedia uh, slash dot com slash building smart. It'll take you right there. And you can listen to Mac Lamy and others at HOK talk about how you build a world-class firm. That's my the conclusion. I'm I'm eager for questions. Thank you. Love it. Um, I did promise Eddie that here he sent this question earlier. When buying out current owners, we sometimes find ourselves with excess treasury stock. Uh, we've combated this a couple times by retiring shares and also by splitting shares to reduce the stock price. Is this common with firms going from generation to generation? Yes. Yes, it is. In other words, uh, I think what, what the question is, is okay. I got stock at nominally, you know, when companies are starting, they put their stock at a dollar value or maybe $10. And if the stock grows, which we all certainly hope it does, uh, over time, if, if we do the right job, if it grows, it's going to be $20 and then $50 and then $100. So at HOK, during my 50 years, I think we split the stock three or four times to always get it down to the point where it shares uh, per share cost was not so high. Now, what does splitting stock mean? Uh, it doesn't mean anything with the value of the firm. It means simply, let's say the stock went to $20 and we want it to be 10, you can split it two to one, which means everybody who had one share got two shares. Now you got two shares worth $20 instead of one. So the value of the company is the same. They're just double the shares. There is a benefit to that in that younger people can afford to buy a $10 share more easily than a $20 share. Right. And um, the math gets a little complicated if shares get to be more than $100. So we just said, we don't want the shares to be more than $100. But uh, stock splits and uh, companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange and, the, and exchanges around the world do the same thing. Uh, a few companies don't. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, I think their stock value is 4,000 and some or right. 40,000 or some big number. Uh, so you have to mortgage your house to buy a share of that company. But we wanted our stock to be accessible to young people uh, without breaking the bank. Love it. Okay. Um, Robert had another question, which is what is your opinion about growing your firm through acquisitions? Uh, that's a great question, Robert. Uh, Robert and, and everybody, um, HOK did do, so did do some growing through acquisitions. And I would say we got about half of it right and half of it wrong. Uh, here's what you have to watch for. Uh, when people think about acquiring a firm, what are you acquiring? 
Well, maybe a client list. And certainly if they've got any cash or something, but you're typically, when you're buying another firm, you're typically buying out the firm's founder or leaders. And so you're getting the employees and maybe some backlog and you still have to work to keep those clients, uh, their, their loyal clients to keep them, to make them your clients. And remember, slavery in this country was outlawed in 1865. So those employees who come along with the company don't have to stay with you if they don't like it. They can leave and go somewhere else easily. So um, at HOK, we did this wrong a couple of times. We thought that we were buying another firm in New York City, for example, because we really wanted an office there. That's Papa George Helmuth, the, the founder. And we bought Kahn and Jacobs, a, a, a good old line uh, Manhattan firm, just actually at the wrong time because the office marketplace was in decline. But the people in the, in the Kahn and Jacobs office did not want to be associated with people from St. Louis, Missouri. Now, I wonder why. We were the country bumpkins from beyond the horizon past New Jersey someplace. And so HOK New York did not actually uh, become a, a, a prosperous office until a couple of those people had to be shown the door. And we it was so, the culture was so strong that we actually, uh, vacated the office where the kind of Jacobs people were and moved the office across town to another location that we leased with a great big HOK logo on the door. And then people, it was new and different and people said, okay, now I guess I work for HOK. So uh, culture, it's easy to find the value for a firm. It's an accounting exercise. It's pretty easy. So it's a little more difficult to make sure that the firms are compatible in terms of how you operate. I mean, maybe maybe uh, one firm uses Revit and the other uses Graphisoft. Uh, uh, so you, you wanna look for things that are easy to fit together. One firm uses one accounting system, one uses something else. Uh, so if you can, if you can fix the price, fixing the price is the easiest. The hardest is to determine if culturally you're compatible. Are you gonna like each other? Will you fit together like one big happy family once this is done? Anybody who's married a spouse knows that you don't marry just your spouse, you marry into a family. Right. And I can see Zach nodding because I know he's a new father. <laughs> so Zach, I hope you and your wife <laughs> like each other's family. <laughs> we do. That's forever, right? <laughs> we do so very much. A merger of two firms is a lot like a marriage. And uh, so the hardest part to, to determine is if the culture is right. Uh, we got better at that as we went. Um, the easiest part's the money, and the intermediate level difficulty is: Are we do we operate the same way? What kind of adjustments will we have to make? All right. Okay, great question. Um, we've got like four more queued up, just so you know. So, um, Greg asked. Uh, he said, "Name your successor a year early?" Question mark. If a client is at a firm for reasons of leadership and you announce your retirement early, it seems like it could be a problem as they might be viewed as lame duck. Yeah. Okay. So let me pick at that one. That's a good question. Um, first, you don't, when you name a successor, you don't name a successor, you name your assistant. You don't say, okay, this is my replacement. I'm going to retire in 12 months. You don't do that. You name somebody, I'm going to say three years ahead as here is my assistant. If they work out, they can become your replacement as you as you step down. If they don't work out, you can say, I need another assistant. But you don't announce your retirement. And uh, actually, let me pick at that. You know, architects and engineers, we work with our minds. We don't work physically hard except lifting a pencil or a mouse or something. Um, the old idea about retiring at age 65, I worked until I was 75. And then I didn't say I was retiring. I said I was repurposing. So you people that are close to the time when you, when you want to step away from your practice, think about what else you want to do with your life. If it's sitting on a rocking chair in the front porch, 
I don't advise that. That's that happened to my grandfather, and he he was gone within two years. You want to have things to do, and you have gifts from that lifetime of of experience to give. So don't retire, repurpose. That's that's my little sidebar advice. Okay. But name a successor, but name a name that person, man or woman, as your helper or your assistant or your un, or, or something. Uh, don't announce your own that you're going to step down until you're absolutely sure not only that your your understudy is capable of stepping in, but gradually start showing up at your client's offices with the, your understudy. And now uh, and don't say this is the person who's going to replace me. Say this is my person that's helping me and let them build those relationships and gain the confidence of your clients. And if they gain your client's confidence, they better also gain the confidence and the and the allegiance and the loyalty of the people in your firm. If they do both things and you give them a little, little room, they might just surprise you about how good they really are. Right. Okay. Great that was question. a great question. That was, that, I enjoy those ones. These are, these um, are good. So we've got a couple questions along the lines of stock value. I'll come. I'm going to kind of bunch these ones together. So the first part from Daniel is how do you determine the stock value? Because it seems to be a little different than the book value. And then along those same lines, Eddie was asking, um, did you offer company stock to licensed versus non-licensed individuals? And then questions around establishing board of directors and number of directors. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's a bunch of questions. It is. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So yes, yeah, so let's let's take it. And and Zach, you help me. Absolutely. If I, if I so miss some of these. Yeah. Let's so let's talk start about with how you establish stock value. Stock value. Okay. Okay. So you're right. Stock value is not book value. So I'm going to make an imaginary company. Zach and I are partners, and uh, we decide we're going to share. We're going to we're going to have 50 50 ownership at, to start, and um, and that we've got a company that's that's already magically going, and we add up all of our assets and all of our liabilities. And our assets are $2 million and our liabilities are 1 million. So we have a book value of $1 million. So Zach, you and I are halfway to being millionaires. We each have a half million bucks. Like but remember, we've got a company that we're investing in. So we're not gonna just take that money and put it in our pocket, but we each have a half million dollars. Now, let's say you and I have this, this company that's worth a half million dollars. We wanna, we wanna, uh, make ourselves into a corporation of some kind or a partnership, but I, I prefer corporations for good legal reasons. But yeah. anyway, absolutely. And uh, so we got a half million dollars. I'm going to say, let's, let's make the, uh, let's, let's issue. You can do this, make it up out of your own. Let's, let's make each share worth 10 bucks. Okay. So let's see the math getting a little complicated now. $10 per share, we just made that up. We're sharing a half million dollars. So that means half a million divided by 10, 500,000 divided by 10 is 50,000 shares. Everybody got that high level math? <laughs> we got 50,000 shares worth 10 bucks each. I got 25,000, you got 25. Right? Right. Now I'm gonna make up another 10,000 shares. I'm going to put them in my treasury, not assign them to anybody. They're just sitting there. Now you and I decide that we need two other people in the firm. And we're going to make them junior partners. So you and I each have, let's see, what was the number? 10 bucks a share, um, 50,000 shares, wasn't it? So we each right. got 25,000. Each got 25, right. So let's say that each one of our new partners is going to be to start with a thousand shares. Okay. And they're not partners, they're owners. Owners, okay. They're junior owners. So we're gonna issue a thousand shares to them, but we're not gonna give it to them, they're gonna have to buy it, right? If you if you give them the, the shares, what do you do? You dilute the shares that Zach and I have. So we're gonna ask them to pay for it, just like you do if you bought AT&T or IBM or General Motors or somebody. So okay, we got these two young, bright employees, and we're going to give them. We're going to sell them, not give them. We're going to sell them a thousand shares each, ten bucks 
times a thousand, ten thousand okay. dollars. I don't have a thousand dollars. How can I possibly have a thousand dollars? I just got out of grad school and I got a bunch of student debt and da da da. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to give that ten thousand dollars. We're going to keep it in the treasury, and we're going to bonus it to you if we make. Uh, if we make enough money, we're going to bonus it to you in two installments. Okay. Okay. So uh, $5,000 or, or 50 shares, let's see, 500 shares uh, this year and 500 next next year, plus some cash. You don't ever give, don't ever bonus somebody 100% stock. You know why? Why is that? IRS. Ah, uh, okay. I bonus somebody. $1,000 of stock. They just now had $1,000 added to their taxable income. Right. They got to pay the IRS and the state tax people and so on. Right. Right. And so you never want to do that because you'll put them in a tax bind. Right. Well, so if you want, if they don't have cash of their own, and most employees do not, help them by giving them some stock in a bonus and some cash and not just enough to cover them. The, the taxes, but enough cash that they can uh, get their kids teeth straightened or they can make a down payment on a house or right. they can pay off a car or maybe some drill down some student loan and pay it off and so on. Right. So, so you made up now you made up a thousand shares of stock out of whole, out of nothing, but in order to have it work, you're, you're having them pay for it either out of profits by a bonus system or out of a bank loan, like I had to do my first time, or maybe they have cash and they wrote a check to the company. Right. That I did that a few times. The company, the HRK said, Patrick, you're, you're growing in responsibility. Um, we bonused you some stock, but we'd also like to, to, to have you buy some stock. And by then I was making better money. I had steady bonuses. My kids were, uh, past the braces stage. And uh, and so I was able to sit down and write a check to HOK. I paid full value for that stock. So when I did, it meant that what? Now, Zach, you and I, help me with the math. We each had 25,000 shares. Right. Okay. Now we've got two younger employees that have 1,000 shares. Right. So now we've got 50,000 between the two of us plus 2,000. Plus 2,000. Now right. this company has got 52,000 shares in it. But the value is still the same. Well, the value right. went up, excuse me. It went up because those people paid cash, either through a bonus or a loan or cash for that stock. So now our company's book value went up, but the stock value stayed the same. That's a little complicated. I didn't mean to make it that. But you get the idea that you don't dilute the stock. You try not to dilute it ever. Right, right. Uh, so it's just like the big boys and girls play in the New York Stock Exchange. Gotcha. You, That's you good do advice. It, you know, if you're going to be a grown up, you do it the grown up way. Right. Let's see if that. And I, uh, who was that from? That what was from was Daniel. It? Daniel. Daniel, if you have some follow up on that. Yeah. Well, punch it into Tom and let's see if we can answer it. OK. And, and if um, I want if somebody else in the audience wants to hear about something different than stock, give a shout out. And, yeah, you know, we're. I, I want to get to Eddie's question real quick around um, company stock while we're on it. Licensed individuals versus non-licensed, right? Yeah, so we yeah, have yeah. our licensed, uh, yeah. you know, architects or engineers versus folks yes. on that path, right? It's very simple. At HOK, if you're not licensed, you can become a shareholder, a stockholder. Okay. But there's a limit. Okay. You cannot, uh, at HOK, and I think at most companies, this would be true. The more responsibility you have, if you're leading projects, you're at a level of responsibility. If you're leading an office or a group of people like the engineers or something, you're at a higher level. If you're on the board of directors or leading the firm, you're at another level. Each one of those means more stock. Right. Um, our limit for this was you can be unlicensed, an unlicensed engineer, architect, planner, landscape architect, and so on. Um, but if you're unlicensed, you cannot lead an office and you cannot lead a group like you can't be the head engineer. Right. Or something. Right. Gotcha. And you can have stock, but you can't have that next big level of right. higher responsibility. So in HOK, our rule was and is 
if you're a principal in an office, you must be registered. Okay. And if you are not, we'll help you. If we think you have the, the leadership uh, moxie to be a leader, we'll help you with, you know, we'll get you a tutor and we'll give you some time to, to study. But if you can't pass that exam and get yourself licensed, you cannot be a principal in HOK. Right. So you need to draw a line somewhere. And the where we drew it was people that are in offices that are responsible. If you're going to sign a contract, stamp drawings, speak for the company, you better jolly well be licensed. Right. I myself, because of our uh, of our uh, structure, uh, when I was CEO, I was licensed in something like. 40 states and several provinces of Canada. it can be done, but you got to work at it. And that's part of continuing to build the professionalism of your firm. If you're running a small firm and everybody's stressed and you're worried about the next meal and collecting the next bill, you're probably not ready for this kind of discussion. Right, right. That's a down the road. Yeah. So just to recap, so there's not actually a limit on the amount of stock a, an unlicensed person would be able to get if they buy, if they came in and it was their first ever job, you know, in their teens or early 20s and stayed with you uh, the entire time, right, a 40, 50 year career, they could accumulate a lot of stock. They just couldn't get to the next level that would allow for a larger accumulation. You mean right? if they're not registered? If they're not registered, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We had many people at HOK and still do. Okay. who are accountants right. and um, admins and, and uh, uh, office managers. Right. Those are typically non-design professional jobs. They're professional in other ways. We have IT professionals, right. uh, HR professionals, uh, and so on. Those people are also shareholders. Right. But they, there is a, they, they're not going to be at the top, tip top, uh, our our little rule was HOK is going to be uh, the leadership of the of the offices and the company is going to be by design professionals, architects, engineers, landscape architects, etc. I love it. Um, I wanted to get to this question from Steve. Any tips on finding talent, talented people in a competitive market? It's a broad question, but it's a yeah. great question. Sure. Uh, first of all, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's the, the trick, isn't it? How do you find talented people? Right. If you mean entry level, just out of college, that's one question. If you mean people that are already, let's say 10 years into their career and, uh, you're looking for somebody that knows how to put a building together or design a, uh, structure or something, those are two separate tracks. Okay. Here's the way to do it with entry level people. And I, I do this every day and twice on Sunday. Uh, go to the best university that's nearby that that offers uh, professional level, uh, uh, you know, courses in architecture and engineering and whatever. Uh, in, in the Bay Area, it's it's probably Berkeley, right. uh, Cal Poly, Cal Poly, UCLA maybe and, yep. and so on. Right. And uh, develop a relationship with the, the the schools of architecture or the schools of planning or the schools of engineering and offer to uh, get involved with some, uh, with helping the faculty, um, maybe do some guest lecturing or uh, be part of a, of a panel to do some grading of uh, design work or whatever it is. And also offer to, um, uh, offer to have summer internships for some of their students. Right. If you have a good reputation and if you pay your interns, pay them, pay them a, a, a salary while they're there. Don't, don't, don't cheap out with the no pay. <laughs> right. Stuff. AIA doesn't like it. Neither do I. Paid interns are a free look. Somebody works for you all summer, Tom, Dick or Harry, it doesn't matter. If they're good, ask them to come back next summer. And when they graduate, you ask them, would you like to come to work for us? That's the way to do it. Right. Then you, so the paid internship is like a free look. Hiring somebody who's 10 years into the business, uh, that's harder. Uh, HOK regularly employed headhunters, professional search firms uh, to do this. But often we found people that we knew, other firms, 
gee, um, we found this other firm had this particularly terrific uh, healthcare person that just knew everything there was to know about operating rooms. And they kept beating HOK at our game, you know, winning the work. Well, what did we do? We we approached the, the that person that was so talented in healthcare and said, would you like to come to work for us? And usually if they're interested, it's because we could offer something more. Well, what could you offer that my firm doesn't offer? Well, maybe some more money, but usually it didn't boil down to that. It's more opportunity. Right. Uh, maybe uh, an opportunity for uh, a higher position of more responsibility, or maybe an opportunity to work on three different kinds of healthcare facilities, teaching hospital and a trauma hospital and a something else. So um, you recruit, you know, architects and engineers are really good at stealing people from each other. It's an honored tradition. <laughs> and I like to think of it as finding people that fit into my culture and don't fit as well into the other firm's culture. Right. Uh, but it's a, it's a search. And if you're running a good firm, you've got somebody in an HR role that's looking for people all the time. I love it. That's, I, you said it in the beginning, that's a million dollar question, right? And, yep. I, yep. and I love the answer about internships. You know, I work really heavily with the Architectural Foundation of San Francisco, yep. training students. Internships are a very big part of what those students are looking for. Yep. I do understand it is challenging, especially in the in a digital world, right? Where we can't actually bring folks into the office at the moment, um, but it yep. is absolutely the best way to get a look at somebody. Yep. So, A question from Al, I believe we are... A one owner firm with five employees. We're currently located in Emeryville, which is in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. And we would like to open a new office in SoCal, Southern California. What is the best way to branch out? When is a good time to do it? Yes. Okay. Great question. Five people, you know, um, HOK didn't spring forth fully giant. Uh, it, you have to start someplace. If you want to be in SoCal, uh, let me just say first, you got five people now in Emeryville. Why SoCal? It's because you want to be geographically dispersed because the kind of work you do, there's a lot more of it in LA. If so, that's that's a very good reason. Right. Um, the key to it, the key to it is there's a slower or a fast way. If you're five people, you're probably not going to buy a firm down there because I'm guessing you probably don't have the resources. Uh, it means Finding a finding a job there I means doing some marketing or prospecting down there, probably, and finding that first job on the promise of if we if you, Mr. or Ms. SoCal client, give us a job, we'll we'll open a little office to do the work. Or maybe in these days of electronics, we'll service the living daylights out of it. You'll get my personal attention, but we're going to do the work from Emeryville until there's a until we're in construction services phase or something like that. Uh, but the key to it, the whole key to it is people. If you put a, a, a less than excellent person in that position in SoCal into a first office down there and they're, they don't know how to do everything because, you know, for a pioneer work, you have to do it all. You have to, get the work, you have to do the work, you have to take care of the clients, you have to hire the next person to help you. And it's a huge job. So doing that means you have to have the right person to put in that spot. If you do, good for you. Uh, HOK, just to by example, uh, HOK, when I joined, the firm was one office. It had grown from nothing to 150 people in St. Louis, Missouri. I think I was 152nd employee. Um, I joined in 1967. In 1970, HOK opened its first branch office. How did they do it? They took four people from St. Louis. I'd never been west of Denver. I didn't know anything about California except I knew it was warm there when, when the Rose Bowl was played. That's all I knew. <laughs> I flew to San Francisco as one of the four was completely blown away by the beauty and the, the, just the sheer beauty of the Bay Area, just physically. 
you know, I, I always thought water was brown, like the Mississippi, but it turned out it's actually blue. <laughs> uh, and and buildings are white in San Francisco and they stay white. They don't turn black. Anyway, uh, you've got to have the best people. So HOK built up to the point where they had enough people that they could begin to populate other offices. And in fairly short order, we had San Francisco, Washington, D.C., Dallas, and New York City, the problem office. Right. New York was the only one that we bought a firm. We ended up having to put people from St. Louis there in order to kind of get the firm, that office on an even track. By the time we did that, the Guy Obata was complaining that his good designers were being robbed from him in St. Louis. And so it's all about people. So if you have a firm of five or six, whatever you said, you got to have at least one stellar person to put there. Otherwise, it might be early to do it. Right, right. It sounds like, I mean, most of the answers come back to good people, right? It really, really does. Yes, uh, and and some reasonable, uh, reasonable prudence about how you make money and put keep some of it in your pocket. Right, right. Um, we had just one more queued up. If anybody else, we've got about 10 minutes left scheduled. So by all means, keep sending questions. Um, Greg had just kind of made a comment, which was, could you opine or share your opinion on acquiring talent by acquisition? Um, yes. I think we yeah. talked a little bit about that, but if you want to go a little deeper. Yes. Uh, it, it can be done. It, uh, it can work again. Um, why do you buy another firm? Well, maybe because of the reputation. HOK has expanded a couple of times. Uh, or, you know, Helmut's idea that you diversify your practice. We achieved some of our diversif diversified practice in building types and in geography by acquisition. New York was a disaster, but a success story also in New York was that we bought a firm in recent years when I was CEO that was a hospitality uh, specialist. They knew ins and outs of designing hotels. And HOK had designed some hotels, but never had a specialty practice. And that firm in New York also had a branch in Shanghai, China. So when we, and uh, that firm became available for sale because why? They ran out of money, cash flow problems. Right. And uh, we were able to buy that firm, the people that were in it, that had the talent were grateful for the opportunity to, to have a job that would pay every week, or every two weeks, right? Not miss a paycheck. And um, most of them are still with us. A couple of them have retired now, but we, we now have an HOK hospitality practice. Right. Um, uh, so it can be done. It can be done. It's all about, can you get those people to be HOK people or, or, XYZ people, your own firm. Can you are those people the kind of people culturally they're gonna feel like they they're among friends and that they're well cared for? You know, let me just say one other thing about this. Most people in a firm don't necessarily want to figure out how to run the firm. They just want to design or they just want to do their they want to practice their practice, technical architecture or sustainable design, something. They want the firm to be straight with them, take good care of them, right. give, them up, give them steady work, steady paycheck, bonus at the end of the year, help them take care of their families or their own personal needs, and uh, nice people to work with. That's what most people want. That's a lot. Uh, HOK is, uh, became like the Medici of the Middle Ages, or of the Renaissance, rather, Medici family, which became uh, patrons of the great artists and sculptors, people like Michelangelo. Medici family said to Michelangelo, look, here's, here's, some, here's a studio to work in. Here's a bunch of marble to carve. Here's your tools. Here's some helpers. Here's, some, here's a paycheck. Now go out and do some great stuff. So he was taken care of right. by this family. I, my idea is that that if you're running the right firm, your firm is the patron of your employees. You're taking care of your employees so your employees can do what? Take care of your clients. Right. Okay. 
I that's that you and I have done, I think multiple episodes on leadership. And I think that's one of my favorite things that you said to me, which was kind of understanding that yeah. not everybody wants to be a leader, right? Just really, really meeting somebody where they're at in your firm and under, and, and being right. able to give them that because not everybody wants to run the firm, be CEO, right? Well, and, and, you know, when a firm of HRK was uh, 1800 people or so, when I stepped down, uh, there can't be all, everybody can't leave. Sure. Firm. Right. doesn't work. Uh, and I didn't think I was on the top. I really literally thought I was on the bottom helping right. to hold it all up. Right. Servant leadership. Servant leader. Okay. That, that was a great question. Um, we have about five minutes left. Any other questions? We don't have anything else in the queue right now. As folks are starting to trickle out, we want to just say thank you. Um, this is Patrick's book, uh, Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm. We are raffling off a copy of it. And then we have a link uh, for a discounted copy too. If you don't win the raffle, don't fear. We can get it in your hands. Um, oh, one more question from, from Al, who is the gentleman or, or person who asked about the, the SoCal office. Um, it says, currently I handle the sales myself and I like to have a person or team to handle the sales. Um, and I, or I'd like to, and I like to, um, what is the best strategy for building a sales team? Should we start sales plus marketing or people teams? Uh, I think I understand your question. That's Al. Right. I think I understand your question, Al, or, or maybe I've misunderstood it, but let's just, because Helmuth, uh, George Helmuth began as a full-time marketer. I think he was probably the first principal in a, in an architecture practice that was full-time marketing back in the, in the fifties. Um, uh, when you talk about marketing and sales, I just, uh, my simple way of thinking about world, the world is marketers are looking for potential clients, right. potential things for people to, to get interested, to work on. And so they're, they're, they're turning over rocks and looking under, under, uh, uh, you know, under every under every rock is is there somebody that needs something from that we can provide, right. and then you have to nurture them. Uh, sales has changed. If sales meaning closing the deal, that's what my interpretation. Mm -hmm. Sales has changed. Marketers don't sell as much these days as they used to. Marketers bring the client and the firm together and let the people in the firm who are going to do the work sell right. themselves. Right. It used to be that Helmut did everything. He said, you know, uh, I know that my, he called them my boys, because then it was mostly men. My boys can do this work for you. Sometimes he'd bring Guy Wobata in for some, some, for some design sales. But now clients want to see who's going to, what's, what team are you going to put in front of me to do this work? Let me meet that team and see if I like them. And so, uh, marketing is now more of matchmaking, putting a client together, finding a client, right, and putting them together with the best team that you can muster. I love it. I love it. Um, we have two more minutes, and we have here in the comments a question that I don't know if it's tongue in cheek, but um, Robert had said, "How do you get someone to buy you out if you're tired of doing it all?" So, <laughs> Robert, <laughs> that's a I question think, I'm sure everybody's asked themselves. Yeah, I mean, Robert, there's the long way. There's the there's the there's the thought out way, and the, there's the emergency way. Emergency way is if you're tired of it and you want to retire or stop doing this, uh, you can find look for another firm to buy you. There are brokers. Yes, who, there uh, are. It's a big business. Who, uh, there, as there are headhunters, there are firm hunters. Right. So you can put yourself on the block. Right. Uh, the better way to do it is to start long enough ago to get some good people in your firm. The best way, in my opinion, hands down, is to have people that are that started out as your employees. Eventually, the the uh, the best of the brightest of them rise to the top, become your partners, and then they succeed you. That's the best way. Perfect. Well, I'll tell you what, Patrick, I think that's all the time we have for today. So um, we are getting tons and tons of thank yous. Everybody's saying this was great information. 
Really appreciate all, everyone's participation and, and asking great questions. This recording is available. Um, I'll say it again. We'll follow up by email as well. But please, 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 if you want to share it with somebody, email me. We'll get that in your hands. Um, we are doing the raffle uh, when this is done for Patrick's book, Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm. Um, and actually, just a side note on the topic of stock, I do, we did a webinar last month, very pertinent on ownership transition and, and ESOPs and how to value stock. So we do, I, ha I have a contact if you need somebody who literally was a practicing engineer and specializes in that. Uh, but Patrick Field did all these questions wonderfully. So um, that's all the time we have for today. If you have any more questions, feel free, please shoot me emails. We're happy to answer them. Patrick, can't thank you enough. This was wonderful. Such a great use of time. It's my pleasure. And uh, my great wish is that all of you get something out of this and build better firms because the world sure needs better architects, better engineers. Right. It is all, it is truly about passing this down to people so that they can make a difference. So exactly. I love that. I love that about your intent. So awesome. Everyone, thank you so much. We'll, uh, we'll see you in hopefully next month.